engine one is down and out of service because the flux capacitor isn't generating 1.21 <laughs> gigawatts, and they call us to see if we have a flux capacitor, which I have. Hey, it's Sam from the 2448. On today's show, we have Wayne Stevens from Safe Tech Profire. He's had two stints in the fire service, has worked in the fire truck industry, and we're really excited to have him on the show to hear his story. You were 19 years old, you got into the fire service, and it was kind of a family career path. Is that something that like you had always dreamed of, or was it something that you kind of just thought you needed to do, or why did you do that? You know, at the time, I think it was just what I wanted to do, and whether I was rebelling against my mom, as teenagers do or not, uh, you know, I can't say for sure, but uh, but there was definitely a calling there, you know, and seeing that my father was a was a firefighter at the time, a career firefighter, and, and again, I, I think it was just inevitable. There was no escaping it. There just wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> What was it during your academy that you thought was like, or I mean, during the academy, but like during your application process, what was it that drove you to say, all right, yeah, I want to do this. And then how'd you get through that first phase? You know, I, I, I think it's not unlike a, a lot of kids, you, you know, you, you, you see the fire trucks every day and you go, you know, you know it'd be cool to be a firefighter. I want to be a firefighter. I want to help people. I want to serve. Um, and, and, you know, if you're wired that way. And again, we, we talk about it now, if it's in your DNA, you know, it, it just is. And uh, so I think it was probably uh, predetermined, predetermined, and there was no escaping it. And uh, so I took that opportunity. You know, they gave me an opportunity because, again, I was a kid. I was 19 years old, literally on the first day of recruit class. I, I, it was my birthday. And uh, No way. And was it a volunteer academy or was it like a, a big place? No, full time. It was, uh, so it was Markham, Ontario, which is, uh, it, it, it borders the city of Toronto to the north. Um, so it was a, a growing city at the time, and, and that was part of my career trajectory. We were growing. It was, it, at the time, it was the fastest growing community in Canada. Oh, wow. So we were opening up a new fire station almost every year, hiring 20 people, opening up a new fire station. So in my recruit class, we were all promoted to officers within five years. You know, not oh, because really? that was the plan. It was just we were growing that quickly and, and, and uh, there was no one else. We were the senior people at the time and, and uh, got promoted to officer positions. So uh, it was a pretty steep climb on my career uh, trajectory right from the beginning. From the yeah, beginning. it wasn't necessarily planned that way. Had folks in your family also run businesses, or were they really like your family history, which is firefighters that are salt of the earth type of guys and gals? Well, my mom, no, my mom was an entrepreneur and and, and was on the business side, and, and you know she worked for a large international uh, corporation for a number of years, and then she she had the entrepreneurial spirit and went off and started her own businesses, and even to this day she you know she's approaching 80 years old and she's still running a couple of her own little businesses. So so I guess that was inherent in in, in somewhere inside as well. So it was that nice balance between you know fire service and and wanting to do that and always knowing I think I always knew that I had that kind of entrepreneurial spirit I wanted to do something and I didn't know what it was uh, never actually planned to be here at Safe Tech Profire or, or being a part of this necessarily and yeah uh, and yet uh, here we are that's super cool you know, when you were in the academy, I, I, I tell people all the time, this, you know, this podcast celebrates the people who are firefighters by training and business people by profession. And it's like, right. it just happens that so many people end up doing both. And whether it's they volunteer and then they run a business or they work full time in the fire service and a business happens in the off time or, or how those stories come about. But I'm curious, you know, in your career, especially in a big career agency, did you have... Um, others kind of like other folks that you knew like what was business a thing in the canadian off time fire service is it like it is here in the u.s when folks are in the 48 yeah it is i mean uh, you have a side hustle most of the guys had a side <laughs> hustle right landscaping or painting or whatever it was and and a lot of uh, a lot of them ran their own little side you know hustles or side businesses not necessarily you know big companies or big corporations but absolutely i think you know the profession at the time lent uh, to that you know, on your downtime or your off time uh, to do something. So, so yeah, I, I think, you know, in my experience working both Canada and the United States, I think it, you know, it's very similar. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And, and what do you guys do today? I mean, I, I know Safe Tech Profile, obviously we've done some business together, but how, you know, for those of our audience that may not know what you guys do or what the markets you serve are, kind of tell me a little bit about what that is. 
You know, so we, we started off in 1993, so this year we're celebrating our 30th anniversary, and our founder, John Witt, started off initially as a Smeal dealer. And what made uh, him and Safe Tech unique is is that we're a national dealer, so we're the we're now a Rev dealer. So Rev, so we represent uh, Spartan, Smeal, E1, KME, Ferrara. Outside of the Rev family, we also represent uh, uh, SVI Trucks out of Colorado, oh, and we represent a, a smaller Canadian builder called Metal Fab out of the east coast of the United States. And what makes so what makes us unique, I think, is the number of brands that we represent. Uh, number one and number two, we're a national dealer, so we, we represent all across Canada. Is that common up there, or is it no. like uh, not everybody does that? No, no. Uh, you know, in Canada, I think it's much like the United States, where you have regional dealers and might have one or two provinces. You know, like you might have one or two or three or four states in the United States, uh, but we have all tw all ten provinces and three territories. So. As, as we say in Canada, we're coast to coast to coast, Atlantic to the Pacific to the Arctic. And uh, <laughs> That's we, awesome. yeah. we've, we've got trucks, you know, everywhere in, in places in Canada that you can't, can't imagine, including north of the Arctic Circle. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty well, cool. Well, take me into the story about kind of how the fire service, like, you know, I, from what I understand, you, you had, what, 10 years or longer? I mean, a pretty long time as a firefighter. And then eventually you made this business transition. But what yeah. was it like kind of growing through your fire service career? And why did you even begin looking at business? Well, I, my career, as I said earlier, is uh, where I was in Markham, we were growing so quickly. We were getting promoted quickly. So I went through uh, captain, training officer, chief of training in, in Markham. Uh, you know, oh, wow. And, and I was chief of training before I was 30 years old. Uh, so it, it, yeah, That's it was awesome. it was crazy. And when I tell this story to, to people that have been in the fire, and, and we'll get to the part of my career when I moved to the West Coast. But so I went from there. So I think I was 29, 30 years old, and then I got the opportunity to go to a neighboring department to be the deputy fire chief. So there I was, and uh, you know, 30 years old, 29, 30 years old, and I'm the deputy fire chief in a career fire department. You know, so <laughs> having uh, 11 years on the job at that point. Um, that's, and, so that's, that's significant experience, though. I mean, you started at 19, so, you know, 11 years in, there's a lot of guys that are 11 years in, and they're, you know, they're 50. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I had 11 years on the career, and, and uh, by that time, 12 years as a volunteer, because I was still doing the volunteer um, yeah. in, in my home community. So, you know, I think, you know, a, a lot packed into that 11 and 12 years by, by that time, um, and a lot of unique experiences, and a lot of people that gave me an opportunity you know they gave me an opportunity at 19 to become a firefighter uh, they trusted me to, to move into the training division and then soon uh, the chief of training position so I think it prepared me well um, to become a deputy chief even at a young age um, so we did that uh, for a while and then I had the opportunity uh, I got a phone call one night I was at work in my office and got a call from uh, the west coast uh, from someone that I knew who had moved from Ontario to British Columbia and said hey how would you like to come out here and and help me out and be the deputy fire chief in Richmond British Columbia so that's how I moved to to BC and that no was way. a that was a really unique so I think at that point I was 32 33 years old somewhere around there and I get that's to so Richmond and and Richmond was was unique as as it was at BC at the time because promotions were for the most part uh, based on seniority. So when I got to Richmond, there were people that had been on the job. There were captains and and battalion chiefs that had been on the job longer than I had been alive. And, <laughs> and, so, and you were a deputy chief over there. Uh, and, and I was deputy chief. So <laughs> so I was quickly uh, coined the boy chief in Richmond <laughs> BC, and uh, probably rightfully so. So. How did you learn how to manage people like that? Because, you know, I think about my business career, and it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is manage people that are older than I am. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I'm 32, so, right? So, like, I, everyone's older than I am. But I'm curious, <laughs> like, in that similar role, how, I mean, you had a lot more employees than, you know, at a, at a Richmond agency. That's a big company. You yeah. Know, a big fire think, company. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, we had eight fire stations and, you know, 175 uh, career firefighters. So, fairly, fairly good size organization. You know, I think... I had some really good mentors, some great mentors that that, that helped me. Uh, you know, made a lot of mistakes uh, along the way, as 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 we often do, right? Any and funny stories to share? I'm so curious. There's got to be some. You know, 
you know, I, I shared this one with Chelsea the other day. It's, it's when I got to Richmond. So, so again, I'm 30, I don't know what, 33, 34 years old. And um, the chief at the time there, who was one of my great mentors, Jim Hancock, you know, it, it, he was all about servant leadership, you know. Mm. Um, and, and I took that. So it was a beautiful summer day, and I'd gone out for lunch, come back to, to the fire station, and I just thought, you know what, it's a nice day. I'm going to pull my car around back uh, of the fire station, and I'm going to wash it. I'm going to wash it. And uh, to me, it, it, it didn't seem like anything. So I start washing my car and hosing down the car, and all of a sudden the captain comes out. And again, here's one of the captains that's been on the job longer than I've been alive. <laughs> He's been around a while. And he went up one side of me and down the other, very respectfully, quietly off to the side, uh, telling me that that's not what deputy fire chiefs in this fire department do. That's for him and his crew to do. And his crew was out there just literally ripping the hose and the brush out of my hands. And uh, he uh, just... Uh, quietly uh, told me to uh, to maybe it was best if I went to my office <laughs> so <laughs> you know sorry. but but J you know Jim Hancock had instilled in me uh, you know that idea of servant leadership just because we wore full four gold stripes and, and and a lot of costume jewelry that it didn't mean that we we got our, our we didn't get our hands dirty yeah uh, where but, did you meet Jim what's his background you know, so, so he was uh, uh, in Ontario. He had come from Ontario as well, and we had both um, had the opportunity to do some. We were adjunct instructors at the Ontario Fire College, which is the equivalent to a state fire college. Got so it. we had worked together um, um, because at the time when I, I was the deputy chief in Ajax, Ontario, and we were the first ISO 9001 certified municipality and fire department in North America. Hmm. So we were doing some pretty cool things from a, you know, a quality perspective. So that gave me the opportunity to speak at the Ontario Fire College and become an adjunct instructor. And that's where we first met. And then he had come and taken the job as the fire chief in Richmond. And that's who had called me and said, you know, I need some help out here because I'm talking a different language. You know, we're, yeah. you know, we're both from Canada, uh, being Ontario and BC, but I seem to be talking a different language and I need, I need some help. Would you consider coming out here? and and uh, being part of the, of his That's leadership team. So, yeah. so you know, like, I, I feel so funny. Like, I, I haven't spent enough time in Canada to know a, a whole lot about the um, the cultural differences between, like, West Coast and East Coast. Is it similar? Like, out East here, there's just a very – fire service especially. Like, yeah. the West Coast guys wear the turtle shells, and the East Coast guys are leathers. And, like, the way you think and talk and act is just very different. Is there a similarity uh, in the Canadian? The, you realm? know, it's, it, it's interesting. So, so my career has taken me, you know, from Ontario to British Columbia. I've, I've spent some time in, in the United States as well. And, and here, there are differences. You know, mm. in Canada, in Ontario, they call them uh, fire stations. In BC, they call them fire halls. You know, oh, they're, interesting. There are pumpers in Ontario. There are engines in BC. There are aerials in Ontario. There are ladders in BC. So there, there, there are those differences. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, in my experience, um, you know, all firefighters come from central casting. And the only thing that changes, you can go into a fire station, firehouse, whatever they call it, anywhere in Canada in, in, or the, the United States, and you're going to run into a crew, and the only thing that changes are the names and the faces. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And that's, that's been my experience. Yeah, they might call something a little bit different, but, but, you know, they all have that dedication and that calling to serve. Yeah, and they're all passionate about that, and uh, yeah, uh, they're more the same than they are different. You know. Can you uh, think uh, of any times that were like maybe like a particularly impactful day that you had in the fire service? You know, there's there's been many. You know, and it it you know I don't know if one jumps out. You know, certainly the first uh, the the first you know time that you encounter a fatality. You know, and that's mm. really impactful, particularly when you're a 19 year old, 18, 19 year old kid. Um, yeah, that's something. That, that, was, that was something. You know, and this is this is 1985, 1986, long before we talked about mental health in the fire <laughs> service. Into a critical incident, stressy briefing afterwards. Right. That was <laughs> no, exactly. You know, and it, and it was still at the time. You know, I'm dating myself here, but it was still at the time where you kind of just had. You know, you were expected to suck it up and deal with it. You didn't talk about it. But you know, looking back, you go, "Geez, that was really impactful." You know, those mm. those critical incidents because. You know, as a firefighter, as a first responder, you're dealing with people on the worst day of their life. Yeah. And, you know, nobody calls 911 because they're having a good day. 
you know, they call 911 <laughs> because they need help because they're having the worst day of their life. You know, and, and as, a, as a first responder, as a firefighter, you're trained to do that in the moment and you do what's, what's needed. Um, but you know, in 1985, 1986, there was not that support that we have now. There wasn't that recognition of the whole notion of mental health and, 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 and that. So, so a lot of impactful, you know, uh, incidents. You know, and How did you guys process through that stuff? Like, what what was it like back in those times in the fire stations? You, you know, you, you might have had you know one of your one of your mates, one of your colleagues that you could talk a little bit about it, um, but for the most part, we still weren't talking about it until about the late '80s. And as I recall, the late '80s, Markham was a pretty uh, progressive fire department. We, we we were doing some pretty cool things. So we were one of the first departments in Ontario that that implemented critical incident stress debriefing, and, mm. and where we actually were the city and the department contracted with outside professionals. So that was a few years into my career, but. Uh, they were one of the first, you know, it was one of the first fire departments in Canada to, to wear bunker gear, right, for an example. Uh, to what go were to they wearing before that? Like uh, uh, the three-quarter length coats. And, Tall rubber and, boots? No yes, way. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So, so I'll, really awesome. date, I'll really date myself here, I was going to say, you're uh, definitely dating yourself now. Uh, I am. So, so, so when I started my career, you know, it was the plastic helmets, the three-quarter coats, the tall rubber boots, and I rode on the tailboard. No, you did not. That I is absolutely hilarious. did. I absolutely. We still had <laughs> engines, uh, pumpers. We called them pumpers because it was Ontario. Uh, yeah. Uh, I rode on the tailboard. You know, you hook your arm through the loop, and uh, you know you were going to hit the railroad tracks uh, outside of <laughs> hall number three, and you hung on for dear life. Absolutely. Thankfully, uh, that didn't last long. It might have been a year, a uh, year or so before, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if those were the good old days or not. <laughs> They're rough and tumble, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. How do you think those times help prepare you to kind of get this launch into the business world? I mean, I've, I've heard about the story of, of kind of y'all's business, but there has to be some forming that goes on, right, in everybody's early life and in, in yeah. adolescence and all, or even young adulthood, that gets you yeah. ready for whatever the next phases are. And I feel like the fire service is pretty impactful. It, it is, and I think it's, you know, I was thinking about this on the drive in this morning. Uh, and I think even though the fire service is, uh, you know, uh, public not-for-profit, you know, the training, the leadership training, um, that whole notion, I was lucky to be, and fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to be in some master fire planning exercises, you know, and the translation from that to businesses is, you know, in master fire planning, you really ask yourself, well, what business are we in? You know, you might say, "What space do we want to, you know, do we want to occupy, Sam?" You know, yeah. in, in the fire service, what that translates to is, "What services are we going to provide? Are we going to be fire suppression, EMS, hazmat, high angle rescue, water mm. rescue, whatever?" So, what services are you going to provide, and to what levels? You mm. know, so for some of the the, the listeners, you know, hazmat, are you going to be, you know, awareness, or are you going to be technician uh, operations or technician level? You know, yeah. Are you going to be an interior uh, aggressive offensive fire department or are you just going to be exterior defensive fire department? So you take uh, the types and levels of services that you're going to provide and that's that focus. Hmm. You know, if I translate that to the business side, it's, you know, what products and services or what spaces do we, what space do we want to enter and occupy and to yeah. what level? And then leading people, it doesn't matter if you're in a fire service or you're in, a, 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 in, in our small business, right? It, it's the same. People are people, and I yeah. think uh, you, you treat them and you lead them the same. The only difference is I don't wear costume jewelry when I come to work every day now <laughs> like yeah. I did in my previous life, right? Yeah. Uh, but So I think the fire service gives uh, it, it's a great training ground. I've you not know, heard anybody talk about all the leadership training before. And, and in the podcast, I think that we've had guests of varying sized agencies that they've worked with. But, you know, every fire department, even our small volunteer fire station, there are things that that they do to develop leaders, whether it's officers training or it's just general leadership stuff that, yeah. you know, I think our listeners should probably key into some of that stuff, especially some folks who might be considering starting a business. It's so, like, the stuff exists. And if they're teaching you how to manage people, whether you're managing firefighters, you're managing you know, line employees, you're managing engineers. Like, it's, it's transferable, people, people, right? I think it's interesting. Uh, a absolutely, parallel. and it's transferable, and it's a great training ground for that. Mm. It, it, it absolutely is, you know, and the only difference is, and it is uh, you know, what the outcomes are, you know. Um, but, 
you know, every day, you know, we have a team of 40 people here at Safe Tech Pro Fire, and it's, 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 it's leading them. It's, you know, in, in helping them accomplish what they need to accomplish, no different than, you know, extending an inch and a half or an inch and three quarter hand line to the front door, making entry and doing a primary search. Yeah, it's still like, right. hey, this is the objective. Here's what we need to do. How are we going to get that done on time totally. and totally. in budget, right? <laughs> like, we have 500 gallons of water. We have to do it within two minutes or else it's non survivable. I need you to get to this room. 100%. Go. It's the 100%. same thing. Like, okay, you got this many dollars. You got this much space. Get right. Struck down and get it back in service. So, so your, your experience must be similar coming from a volunteer firefighter to, to starting and building your own company, too. You know, and if you think about it, are those skills and things that you learned in the fire service transparent? You know, and we might not recognize that we're doing those things every day here. Mm. Um, but, but you know, as, again, as I was driving in thinking about this, ago, absolutely, it prepared me probably better than, than business school could yeah, or, or would, would have. Hundred percent. I always say like the biggest and probably the most simple lesson in, in the in the very first fire class that I took, there was one of these. I think it was called orientation and safety, and they were talking about like, listen, in, in the fire service, you have your plan, you have your backup, and you got to have a backup to the backup. And if you've got those three, then when the primary goes away, you're making a new backup to a backup. But now your backup okay. is your primary. So you just iterate down, but it's always three steps of planning, and you're always thinking steps ahead. Absolutely. And in business. I teach our people all the time. It's plan, backup, and backup to the backup always. I don't care if it's lunch plan, if it's FDIC trade show plan, if it's a hiring plan, but we yeah. financial modeling, that simple discipline that I learned early, like one of the very first lessons. And it's like, okay, I'm going to go in this structure and try and do this. Okay, well, all of a sudden there's no floor. Now what do I do? Okay, well, I'm going right. to go around this side. Okay, well, now what do I do? Yeah. That thought process and that stressing has proved so valuable in what we do. And it's, it, that's a fire service lesson. It it, it's not one that they teach in, in business. Maybe they teach in business school. I don't know. I never went there. But in the fire academy, that was exactly what you taught. Know, if you didn't do it, you ran laps all day. You did push-ups until you learned it. So right. it applies in both. 100%. And I remember a million times it saved our bacon. 100%. You know, and I think that serves us well here because, you know, we, we encourage our team, you know, we're going to try a lot of things. And most of them probably aren't going to work. Right. But then we try it. What's, what's, what's the plan? What do we do next? Where do we go next? If we try this and this doesn't work, it doesn't yeah. produce the desired outcome. And for us, the desired outcome is, is we're on this never ending quest uh, to make it easier for our customers to do business with us. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I don't prescribe that to our team. You know, <laughs> they, fig they, they figure that out, but they figure that out by trying things. Yeah. And some of them work to your point, you know, plan A didn't work. What's, what's, what's our contingency? What do we do now? Uh, yeah. Because, uh, so I think you're right. In my experience, the same thing, the fire service, because that's, that's how we do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What, so what was the transition like? So you were, you were the deputy chief up at Richmond. Is that the, the yeah. big, the bigger agency on the West coast that I'm, I'm picturing this in my head. I don't know if it's. Yeah. So, case. so you flew, if you fly into Vancouver, uh, the yep. Vancouver international airports in the city of Richmond. So Richmond is a suburb of the city of Vancouver. So, oh, so, okay. you know, it's a couple hundred thousand people, um, you know, a good size, you know, a nice medium sized uh, city. Um, yeah. so, so I'm there and, and, you know, sometimes life throws us a curveball, Sam, and life threw me a bit of a curveball. And uh, I retired from the fire service and I moved to Colorado. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> USA. Yeah, USA. Quite so, the change. So it was quite the change. It was quite the change. <laughs> but if you, you know, I often say if you're going to move to, uh, to anywhere, Colorado is not a bad place to move to. I've never really thought about moving south to Colorado. <laughs> it, right? <laughs> like, yeah. like the Florida of 50, Canada. 1,500 you know. miles south, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I found myself in, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Oh, and I did, out there. It, it's spectacular, spectacular. Um, and I didn't have a job. Uh, like I said, it was a curveball. And yeah. uh, so so I'm there, and I had the opportunity through some, some contacts that I had developed in the fire service that that E1 at the time was was starting up a new dealership in Colorado. Mm. And I jokingly say I had never planned on being a dirty, rotten, stinking fire truck salesman, uh, <laughs> and, that, and yet there I was. And no training at all no on way. sales. No idea, right? Uh, of course, you know, I knew fire trucks. Yeah, you've been uh, on them, right? Or I knew how to use them. I knew yeah. how to use a fire truck. I knew what they were used for, but I didn't know how they were spec'd. I didn't know how they were built. I didn't know anything about the manufacturing process. I certainly didn't know anything about sales. Yeah. What, when was this? Like early '90s, sometime. This would have been. Uh, this would have been 2003. Oh wow. Okay. Cool. 2003. So after 9/11, uh, fire service began transition. Yeah. 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 So there I am. Need a job. 
take a job um, with the E1 dealership, new dealership, trying to sell fire trucks. And Interesting. How'd that go? Well, I didn't know where to start, you know, and, and the only thing I knew was, what if I approach this as, uh, and I think this is where kind of my business um, um, interest started kicking in because I, I had to figure this out. Um, yeah. And I said, well, the only thing I know is my experience is fire. So if I approach it as being a fire person, talking to other fire people about fire stuff and not trying to sell them anything, I wonder if that'll work. I've got to try it because I don't know how to sell anything. Right? Yeah, so might as well just give it a go. Give it a go. And then the other side, and this, I, I don't think I recognized this at the time, Sam, but, but I thought, you know, I can't go where the big companies or, or the competitors are already well entrenched. You know, the competitor was well entrenched in Colorado Springs, was well entrenched in, in, in Denver, for an example. Mm. And I, this is, I think, where I really started reading about business and business strategy. I love business strategy. I love to sit down and talk with people about strategy and oh, not cool. only just developing the strategy, but how to implement the strategy. And I came across, you know, Walmart. And, and, and I came up with my own crazy little thought at the time and go, I'm going to implement the Walmart strategy. That being, I'm not going to focus on the major urban centers. I'm going to go to the small towns, which in Colorado was a bonus because it, it, it got me to places like Telluride and Aspen. And, oh, I have yeah. to spend the day in Aspen. Right? I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly. And uh, awesome. so I said, well, what if I go to what I believe to be underserviced areas where our competitors really aren't going because they're concentrating on the large urban centers? You know, I need to provide for me and my family at the time, so I need to try to figure out how to sell some trucks. So I came up with this, what I called at the time a Walmart strategy, go to the underserviced areas and, and try to work back towards the major urban centers and, and you know, had some success in doing that. So That's I think cool. that was the genesis uh, of, of me developing uh, business strategy or thinking about it and, and trying to figure something out that I really had no formal training for at the time. Did it work? It worked. <laughs> it, it, so it, it, it awesome. did. It did. You know, I hear that story. It's funny. So I did not have the same foresight you thought to go, oh, let's go try to spot We started, I was in a little town. I started our business in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And our competitors hadn't been to that town in 100 years. It was in the middle of nowhere. And so we started there and started to grow. But it's like, had we been in the city of Raleigh, they just switched to fire tech product like this year, which in North Carolina is like, the, it's the capital city. It took 10 years. I would have spent 10 years knocking on the door. They never would have answered. But every right. little town around there, it was like, surround and drown and all of a sudden then yep. you know it was it was really exciting but it's interesting to think about <laughs> like, yeah that could be a, that's a great strategy i love that thought process it, you know it, it worked and like i said it was just i don't know how i came up with it but uh you know it's, let's give it a go what do that's i got to fine. lose because i knew if i went in and started knocking on the doors in in denver and in colorado springs yeah same thing 10 years <clears throat> you know they still what was probably, it like when you started knocking on doors like what do you remember your first sales call yeah, terrifying, terrifying. And because, you know, as a deputy fire chief, I had spent years setting up these elaborate defense systems around me to keep salespeople away. As and you said, yeah. And now I'm on the other side trying to break through those same defenses <laughs> that so people funny. had set up. Yeah. So, so again, here, here's the thing, I, you know, I said, how do I do this? How do I do this? What's an easier way to do this? And I thought, you know what, a demo. I need to drive a truck. If I drive a truck and I just show up at places, so they were literally cold calls, Sam. Really? Literally cold. Because I was starting with nothing. It was a yeah. new dealership. We, we, we had no, we had nothing. Yeah. We hadn't, you know, literally nothing. And I didn't. So again, I thought, okay, well, I'll get a demo and I'll just drive to Telluride, Colorado and I'll stop at places along the way. Mm. And the remarkable thing happened, and this is why I think firefighters are the same, you know, Canada, the US, East Coast, West Coast, uh, to a certain degree, is what I realized pretty quickly is, is I could drive into small little towns like uh, Salida, Colorado, uh, and all I needed to do was kind of drive through town, 
turn around, drive back to the fire station, and by the time I parked in the front of the fire station, Lenny, they had already Lenny. set off the pagers and the alarm, and there was 30 volunteers <laughs> surrounding, kicking the trucks. And the other thing that I realized pretty quickly is they would say, you're the first one that's been through here with a truck. We've never seen a, a, a rep from a sales truck. And I think that was the beginning of the success, yeah. is going to places, underserved places, Walmart strategy, uh, and just showing up. So what I realized is, is showing up is 80% of the gig. Yeah, it absolutely Just be is. there. <laughs> yeah. Wow. We have this whole okay. thing like, you know, another lesson I learned in the fire service was early is on time, on time is late, and late is not acceptable. You got to yeah. get there. Get there early. Be there. Be ready. Put your boots on and go 100%. to work. And if you just go do that, there's business to be had. And so many 100%. times, I think about it at trade shows, people like, when you get to a show and like, other people aren't even in their booths yet. You're like, what are you doing? The show's open. Where are your people? What is where, get your stand right? up? Yeah. And people sometimes just don't actually show up for the game that they're there to play. And, and you can win by a forfeiture if someone doesn't show right? up, you know? Yeah, and you don't need an MBA to figure that out, right? Yeah. But not, interesting. It, it's interesting that you say that, Sam, because not everybody figures that out. It's funny, and, but and, it is true. I think that, like, you know, I hope that what people will take out of the show that we're producing and, and this whole podcast is some of that spirit and drive that, like, in the fire service, it's harder to I, – I, I can't remember who I was talking to the other day. We're recruiting. We're always recruiting for people. We're looking for some sales guys or something. Yeah. And I said, I want firefighters, but I want the firefighters that want to, like, kick the door down and go be the first on the nozzle, not the ones that wait for the alarm to go off. And we were, then we were, like, unpacking the personality of firefighters. And law enforcement can actively go do, like, proactive policing. There's not really proactive fire service. There's fire prevention. Sure, you can teach a kid to stop, drop, and roll, but it's not the same as, like, I'm gonna go look for people doing no good because you can't really look for a building on fire. If it's either on fire, or it's not. So there's a difference in personality. But what I, you know, what I think so often is, how do you take those firefighters that, by nature during the day, sit at the station? But are they sitting at the station or are they proactive by training, by doing gear checks, by doing all the all the other things, education and kind of being on the spot? Those are the firefighters that we align best with, and those are the firefighters that. I really think make good business people because they are there to show up. It's not like right. I'm just going to answer the phone when it goes off or the pager when it goes off. It's right. I'm here to do this job and I'm going to put everything into it and really go invest. 100%. 100% yeah. show up, right? And you know, we talk a lot about that now in Safe Tech Profire is is you know, we want to be a proactive not a reactive organization. We're not sitting there waiting for the phone to ring, right? Or the next yeah. email to come out. How do we get out there? How do we be proactive like you said? Yeah. Um, you know, and 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 yeah, it's eighty percent of the gig. I, I, I believe that. So how did that up. business grow? You know, as you're going from your first demo to like landing mm -hmm. the first truck sale, and then how did that grow? And, and then eventually you ended up back up in Canada. So <laughs> tell yeah. me that story. Yeah, again, all unplanned, unplanned. So so I had some success in the first year being the E one dealer to the point where I get a phone call one day, out of the blue, phone call. I answer the phone, and uh, it's the president of Rosenbauer America. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And he says, uh, you've been doing a pretty good job in Colorado and you've been taking some business away from our local dealer. All right, just trying to make a living, right? Yeah. And uh, he said, uh, he'd like to meet with you and I'd like to fly out there and put you two together and see if there isn't an opportunity for us to work together. So that's kind of how it started. And I ended up becoming a partner in the Rosenbauer dealership after a year of, no of, way. of sell. Yeah, so so that was the first opportunity to be where I was now, rather than just an independent commission-based sales rep. Now all yeah. of a sudden I'm a partner in a small business. So that was kind of your first step. Was that the first business you'd been a, a part of? Yeah, for, formally, absolutely. Mm. And, and really what was interesting about that, Sam, is, is, you know, coming from a career in the fire service, I learned what stress was really about. And, and stress in small business is wondering if you're going to make payroll on Thursday. Yeah. Right? It's very different than the stress in the fire service. It's still stress. Totally different. It's very different. Totally different. And there's no training for that. You yeah. Know? So, so I've been, you know, you know, a three alarm fire at three o'clock in the morning, you're trained and prepared for that. And yeah, you, you know exactly. Call, you're going to start command structure. You're going to put totally. resources in these places. And if I need more help, I call for more help. Right? <laughs> yeah. Making payroll on Thursday. Totally different level of stress, and there's no training for that. Absolutely yeah, no training for that. So, And I know in your experience building your company that, you know, sometimes you just do, you have, there's things you have to do. You know, you believe in this, <laughs> you want to make it work. Times. Right? Yeah, you look around, you're like, all right, we got to go over there. Why would I have the money to go over there? All right, do my boots work? Yeah. 
We used to, it was like we used to have to carry these trade show companies. They, they're like little thieving trolls. I hate trade shows, but I love doing trade shows. But I hate oh, all we, the companies that produce them. And they we have uh, that in common. <laughs> yeah. So they have these like you pay the union drage, like these guys, these little trolls <laughs> that don't let you cross the loading dock until you get to your trade show booth. And so like I would go there to be ready to do a uh, a trade show or whatever, and they'd be like, "Oh, hold on, it's ten thousand dollars to carry your gear inside." I'm like, Ron, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? My work booth worked yeah. just fine. I'm absolutely going to carry stuff in myself. Nope, you're not allowed to use our loading dock. So I can think yeah. of 15 shows in our corporate history where it was like, mm-hmm. I don't have the money to solve this problem with cash. I do have a pair of work boots and I've got a really strong work ethic. Let me just, I'll park the truck a quarter mile away and walk the things in the front door one at a time on my back. Mm-hmm. There's no rule against that. But sometimes it's like, you just have to do what you have to do. Yeah. It's not in the trade show <laughs> manual. If you can't pay the drage, this is how you yeah. do it, but you got to solve the problem. You do. I'm sure that, that that type of thing had to have occurred in your history as well, you know? Absolutely. And you end up making decisions or doing what you have to do because you believe in it, right? And and not only that, Here here's the thing that, that really, uh, and it, it, it's impressed upon me even today is, is that, you know, in our company, we have 40 people that rely on us to run a, a strong, successful business Mm. right because they have lives they have mortgages to pay they have obligations and commitments they have families and we take that very very seriously um so that's you know when we when we make decisions and we run our business you know we do things because we're living up to the commitments to our team because we believe that take care of the team first if you don't take care of your team you can't expect your team to take care of your customers yeah and it's got to be in that order yeah. So, who were your customers in the fire service? I, I, I haven't asked anybody else in the podcast this, but I'm curious because I always think about our customers when I work. I still work on our county ambulance sometimes. Who are our customers in the fire service? Yeah, like what? What, what, what were the customers? What were the services that you provide? Um, well, it, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, Chief Alan Brunacini, former fire chief of Phoenix, would say, you know, the customer is Mrs. Smith, right? It's it's Mrs. Smith, and 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 that's the public, and it's anyone who calls nine one one is your customer, right? And what are mm. the service, you know? And they're calling on the worst day of your life. And <clears throat> um, as firefighters, you know, firefighters, I think our our job descriptions are are pretty simple, and they're one line: <clears throat> professional problem solver, right? <laughs> so yeah. so that's the customer, whoever calls nine one one, because they're having the worst day of their life. And our job is, is we didn't create the problem. Hopefully we didn't yeah. create it. Um, and we're there to hopefully make it better. Doesn't always work out that way, uh, but we're professional problem solvers. And, yeah. and we try, I, I've tried to bring that to our company. You know, mm. when we talked with, with, with my team and I say, I'm gonna rip up everybody's job descriptions. We're gonna rewrite them and it's gonna be one line. We're professional problem solvers. Our customers call us because they have an issue, problem, or a challenge, and they call us because they trust us to help us. But you can help them figure it out. Help them figure it out. Yeah. You're a professional problem solver. Yeah. You know, you know, the outcome might be selling a truck. It might be selling a part. It might be fixing a truck. But you're kind of um, keeping your focus on that customer. Similar like in an, the fire service, you're keeping your focus on like, hey, how do I help Mrs. Smith? Totally. Totally. But that's not the business we're in. And this may sound crazy, but we're not in the business of selling fire trucks. We're in mm. the business of serving our customers. Mm. We're in the business of helping them solve their issue, problem, or challenge, whatever that means. Now, sometimes that presents itself as, you know, they, they need to replace a 20-year-old truck. That's yeah. the issue, problem, or challenge. Or their engine one is down and out of service because the flux capacitor isn't tr- generating 1.21 <laughs> gigawatts. And they call us to see if we have a flux capacitor, which no. I have. I should get this. I do have a flux capacitor. No. <laughs> I do. That's awesome. Maybe I'll ask Emma to bring grab my flux capacitor and bring it over because I'm quite <laughs> proud of it because my service techs built it for me because I would always use this analogy when we were talking about parts. That's and interesting. I would always, I'd always say flux capacitor. So a couple of years ago for Christmas, my service techs presented me with a flux capacitor. That is awesome. That Good I can plug him. in and it lights up and it's awesome. I love it. It's one of my most prized uh, treasures. That's um, cool. So how did so, you go from, you know, like serving customers as a partner in the Rosenbauer deal? In Colorado, I assume? Colorado, And then yeah. how did the transition occur? I mean, the business continued to grow and somehow you ended up back in Canada. Yeah, you know, again, life threw me another curveball. And uh, 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 it was time to come back to Canada. Uh, mm. I loved Colorado, uh, uh, enjoyed living in the United States, but it was uh, it was time to to, uh, to come back to Canada. And at the time, I had the the opportunity. Do I go back to to Ontario, where I'm from? 
uh, or do I come back to British Columbia? And my, the time that I spent in British Columbia, I just love it. it, it yeah. it's, a, it it's just a beautiful, spectacular place. And mulled that over for about three months. Uh, I stayed at my brother's farm, and uh, I mucked stalls. Um, <laughs> and where did and, he live? Was he East Coast uh, or West Coast? East Coast, just north of Toronto. Uh, okay. And, uh, you know, in January, mucking stalls when it's minus 20, 25. At you four, can have that. Four, <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I, I did that for three or four months, and I think it was really therapeutic, Sam, but I quickly realized that wasn't for me. Yeah. Uh, and had the opportunity. So I came back to British Columbia, and I became the director of – it's called the Justice Institute of, of British Columbia, and I was the director of the fire uh, division. So that's the equivalent of the state fire college. In oh, the okay, States. got it. So, like, so you know, I went from o OSFM or something like that. Yeah. So I went for uh, interesting. So now I went from fire service to business back to the fire service. Interesting. And when I came back, I had called John Witt, the, our founder, founder of, of Safe Tech Pro Fire. I had called John because I had known John since 1999. About re replaying my my history oh, as back a to, as a customer back in the first yes. days. So when I got promoted to deputy chief, uh, when I was 29 years old, I get there and uh, I should have uh, I get there in October of of the year, and the the fire chief at the time says, okay, you have 750 thousand dollars, you've got to buy an aerial and you've got to buy it before the end of the year. Got it. So okay. I call around. I didn't know where to start. Yeah. Call around. Hi, do you have an aerial? <laughs> where do you get your aerials? They all said John with the aerial guy. So I called that's John with the aerial guy. He came and met, as it turns out, about a truck. So, so that's where I had known John since 1999. So when I came back to British Columbia, I called him and I said, hey, I'm back. Uh, you know, and he said, no, no, I just hired a new general manager. I, I, you know, I don't have anything you know, for you at the time. So I, so I took the job as uh, the director of the, uh, the, 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 the fire division at, at the JIBC. Did that for a few years, and, and John called me up one day, and he said, uh, I need to make a change. Are you still interested? So, so we and we had stayed in touch even when I was in Colorado. You know, small industry. Yeah. You go to FDIC. You, you know. Yeah. You run into uh, uh, the usual suspects, as we say. Yeah. And uh, so, I kept in touch with him, and, and in 2013, transitioned again back into business. So by this time, this is my you know my fourth act. Now, yeah. two of them, two of them been in the fire service, and now this is uh, my second act in, in business. So, so I've been with uh, Safe Tech Pro Fire um, since 2013, and and uh, had the opportunity to become a partner, and uh, we're, we're just having so much fun here. But what's really, really interesting is is our business plan that we're kind of executing on now here in Safe Tech uh, Pro Fire in 2023. The genesis of that business model and that strategy and that plan I wrote in 2005 in Colorado. Oh, really? So you kind of yeah. had that thought process, and you're like, "Hey, I'm going to implement this somewhere. I got to find out the right place to implement it." Yeah, absolutely. If I had a dealership, what do I want the dealership to look like? How would we do it? How would we approach it? What would be our mission? All of those mm. things. I, I was just absorbing all of that stuff at the time uh, because it was all new to me at the time. I'd come out of you know 20 some years of career in the fire service, and now trying to reinvent myself and learn something new. Yeah. So I still have those notes, my notebook from 2005 that have, and, and I can still look to those, and, and there's the plan of, you know, our mission for, for an example, say Tech Profile I actually wrote back then. That's cool. So what is... And, and part of my ignorance and not knowing, but what is the difference? Is Safe Tech Pro Fire one company, or is it two companies that kind of merge together, or what's what are those yeah. two entities or that, that one entity? Good question. So Safe Tech, um, again, uh, John started, uh, founded in 1993, and and he focused solely on sales. It wasn't a traditional dealership in terms of so it was a, it was a truck dealer, a, a fire truck dealer. It was one guy. John will often say when you talk to him, he say, <laughs> "I was a one man though. band. I was a one man <laughs> band." Right, and he literally was. He literally was. And what happened was, uh, there was a company in British Columbia called Profire, and John contracted with Profire to do all his parts, service, and warranty work. Oh, really? That's so awesome. that was the relationship. And then, uh, in 2009, Profi uh, Safe Tech became Profire's largest customer. Interesting. Because because John was selling so many trucks at the time. So then he was just so, tying up their parts and service. Like, this was totally. all the business that was channeling through. So Safe Tech acquired Profire in 2009. Oh, the, the little guy acquired the big guy. 
Yes. No Inter- way. Interesting story. My first day on the on, on the job, so to speak. So yeah. So he acquired Safe Tech acquired Profire. So at the time, Pro Safe Tech only had it was John and I think two other people at the time. He had a sales administrator and maybe another sales rep in Ontario. So yeah. it was only three people. Oh wow. He acquires Profire that had 37, 40 people <laughs> because you know parts, yeah. service, and all of that. So 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 to this day, <clears throat> we still have two separate companies. Safe Tech and Profire, but 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 we kind of present ourselves and brand ourselves as Safe Tech Profire, yeah. as, as one company because we're doing business as one company. Sure. Is it yeah. separate facilities and separate teams, or is it no. still like one, one 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 building? One. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, we have we have locations in in British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, but we're yeah. all co-located. Safe Tech and Profire. Yeah, we're we're all in the same same biz- building. That's <clears> awesome. Were you there yeah. when that transition occurred? No, that he he bought that in two thousand and nine, uh, and <clears throat> at the time that I had returned to British Columbia, but he had hired a general manager at the time for that whole acquisition and transition and and, and bringing the two companies together. So I came in twenty thirteen, mm. twenty thirteen, and I I don't know if you you care to hear that story. I shared that with uh, Chelsea. The yeah, other day. line me up. So, so think about this. So he bought it in twenty twenty two thousand and nine. I come in. July of 2013, <clears throat> and the first day I walk into the boardroom, the leaders of Safe Tech are sitting on one side of the conference room table wearing blue shirts. The leaders of Profire are sitting on the opposite side of the conference table wearing red shirts. And we still talk <laughs> about this to the to this day. Like of, two uh, different uh, opposing teams under the side of the they room. Were. No they were. No way. Red versus blue, and blue. And you you picked up on this uh, very astutely. The smaller bought the bigger. That's interesting. But yeah, it doesn't happen that way often. Not often. Um, um, so I still remember that, you know, the re- and I, I talked about this, and this became the first five years of, of being here was trying to make red and blue purple. Yeah. When you joined on, were you assigned to one team or the other? No. So so the way we're organized is, I mean, I, I was hired by Safe Tech, but, but, but Safe Tech, you know, kind of ran at the time yeah because they were because the acquirer, they bought or... right yeah, they bought of course. but we were still we were we were operating as as two different companies like landing in the middle of that room you'd yeah. be like all right well i have now recognized a problem how do you yeah. then problem because you talk about being fire service like that you're com- you're you know conditioned to be world class problem solvers if you're an elite firefighter yeah. how yeah. did you world class problem solve that issue cuz i don't see that today in your organization i didn't even know there were separate companies i mean i, I feel like of course it's all just I've been to the facilities, met the teams. Yeah. Like, yeah, everyone's playing ball yeah. together. You know, it, it it was a five year it was a five year journey for us to get from team red, team blue to team purple. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and now I, I didn't come up with team purple. That was one of my staunchest blue guys who eventually <laughs> one day and said, you know what, I think we're now team purple. And that was a turning point in our organization where I said, okay, good, we're we're we're, we're moving forward. But really. The only thing I knew how to do it at the time, Sam, was, and again, maybe I was drawing on my, my fire service background was, is, is we have to understand that we're here uh, and we have a common purpose. Um, and we're not competing against one another. And again, that three-legged stool analogy, we've got to be good at all three parts, sales and service. And we need, the only way we can do that is work together. But it really started with uh, a, you know, a common vision, a common mission. You know, yeah. and we talked a lot about the why, yeah. and uh, and we need to do that together. So really, it was uh, a common mission, vision, um, stopping, you know, breaking down. So, uh, what's been yeah. one of your harder things? Like as you've been building and, and like entering these teams, I mean, I feel like that's entering a pretty well established team. But like as you're then now growing your team and building and, and yeah, you we know, are. I hear there's some exciting stuff to come. What's yeah. what's um been your most difficult personal struggle as you're kind of formulating these teams in these business ventures you know we talk with our leadership group uh, all the time the hardest thing is 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 you know once you build that culture is 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 paying attention to that you know that cultural transformation was the hardest part the business side of it is actually the easy part mm. but we talk a lot about what we're actually doing here is we're trying to build a company and grow more leaders that's How do you guys do that? Like, do that's you, what do you we're send doing. people out to trainings, or do you yeah, like you know, absolutely? Stuff there? 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, it's a combination of a, of a bunch of things. It's um, it's a, we, we, we have a pretty, uh, I think, a pretty robust uh, training program where we, we just had uh, six or seven people uh, finish a course uh, from one of the local universities on creative problem solving, for an example. And we like to put our group together as a cohort so they can start again working together. So that's part of it, is, yeah. is formal outside training. The other part of it is, is uh, uh, I have weekly uh, meetings with our leadership team and we talk about a uh, purpose, we talk about the why. It's, it, we talk more on the business rather than in the business stuff. Mm. And then I have um, one-on-ones, you know, bi-weekly one-on-ones with all of my leadership group, just making sure that we're all connected and, and, and you know, setting the expectation. You know, sometimes we think that, you know, setting an expectation is a bad thing or it has a negative connotation, but I think at the end of the day, no different than when I was the rookie on the end of the hose line on, on the fire service, <laughs> we want to know what's expected of us. Yeah. We do, and, and what I found out is our team does want to know. You know, so as leaders, it becomes our job to, to identify what the expectation is and then give them the tools, whatever those are. Sometimes it's training, sometimes it's guidance, it's leadership, it's coaching, it's mentoring. Sometimes it's just, it's money. Sometimes yeah. it's resources, whatever those are, so that they can go do the job. Yeah, interesting. Whatever that is. So, How would you give <clears throat> advice to a firefighter that's, you know, like, I'm thinking of, I can't, what, what did you call the fire, like, Johnny the firefighter, whatever, anywhere in from anywhereville fire station, fire department academy, whatever. This central guy, central casting. We, central we, we just call up central casting and we say, you know, Sam left our fire department, yes. and, <laughs> and Sam is this outgoing extrovert, and we need to replace our outgoing extrovert. Yeah. So so, so if they you're send talking us to that person who's either thinking of starting a business or is still a full time mm -hmm. firefighter who has a side hustle, yeah. you know, I always find that it's hard to bridge the gap from like. You know, talking about like the conversations we have with our leadership teams, with yours or mine, or with different folks in our organizations, there are layers and there's structure. But mm -hmm. back 15 years ago, when I started the business, it was just like me and the dog, and they came right. us sometimes. So when, you know, when you think about like what advice can you give someone that's in the trenches of I am a single person operating or starting or launching a business, or I have a couple of employees, but I want to begin building culture for, or begin yeah. putting putting together my leadership team. What sort of advice can, can you kind of garner from the business and the size and state that you are with national coverage to someone who's a, a much smaller fledgling stage of business where it's right. just starting out? Yeah. Um, I, I would say not only think about it, but write down the company that you want to be. What's that like what future you did in 2005. state? Yep. What's that future state? What does it look like? You know? And, and I don't mean by how many people you're going to have and, and what products you're going to serve, but what do you believe in? What's the why? Why are you starting this business? Mm. What's the why? It, you know, uh, uh, and understand that. And if you understand why you're in business uh, and the business you want to start, and, it, and, and then from there it says you have to, I think the only way I know how to do it is, is, is to develop a common vision. And we, we talk in the future state all the time. In our language, it's, it's this is who we want to be when we grow up, right? Yeah. We talk about that all the time in our company. This is who we want to be, but that's that future vision. Yeah. That's where we're going. And, you know, so, so in our organization, it's framed around some company values. We look to bring people onto our company that are supportive of and not in conflict of our values. It's important. We say that can really get behind our mission and our vision and have a passion to serve. And those are our best team members. And yeah. when we have those people, because what I say to our leadership team is, is I'm firm on the destination, but I'm open on how we get there. Now that's an interesting concept. So I like help, that. help me help us get there, right? Yeah. There's not a lot of room where we're going. We're going here. Yeah, this right? is definitely terms, where we're going. So no matter right? what, we got to get there. You know, and, and what I mean by that is we're, we're going to be a proactive problem-solving organization. We're going to do the right thing, not the easy thing, right? We're going to own our mistakes, whatever those are. We're going to, you know, uh, you know, uh, our values. Yeah. And that, that's our future state. Uh, help, help us get there. How do we get there? Um, so that would be my advice. You know, why you're in business, why are you starting your business, and, and what's that common vision or purpose? Because culture is all about just people supporting where you want to go, what that future vision is. 
Yeah. That's the power. That's what culture is. And then it becomes, this is how we get there. So in our, in our, I, uh, you know, I call this safe tech profile is just a, a one big experiment. It's a laboratory where we're trying a bunch of different things. But all of a sudden, the cultural norms. I hear you're a big Dairy Queen guy, Sam. I am a huge Dairy Queen guy. So you, love Dairy so Queen. you need, you, you need to come back to visit us in the summer because we have Dilly Bar Day, where Wait, it really? Even, yeah, we do. And and it, it's not scheduled. It could be any time somebody's out for lunch or something. They stop by the Dairy Queen and they bring back a couple of boxes of Dilly Bar. Shut and it's up. Just I am definitely Dilly going to visit the Dilly Bar. Dilly Bar. But that's become part of our culture. You know, we have monthly potlucks and barbecues. And, and you know, that's nothing that I wrote down. That's nothing in the business plan that says we're going to be a company that has Dilly Bar Day and, and monthly potlucks. That's the team that did that. Right? That's awesome. And, and then it manifests itself in really super cool ways. And th th these are my best days. Uh, the best part of my job is then you get, so we're talking about how do you build that culture. Hmm. But when you build that culture and you have a, 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 a common vision, a common mission, our passion to serve our customers, then really cool things happen. Like I got a call, it's probably a couple of years ago now, and uh, it's a call from our, our Ontario office. And the manager says, you're going to see, you're going to see an Uber bill come through. I said, okay. What's the Where'd Uber you bill? go, says, right? <laughs> Where'd you go? Yeah. He goes, well, um, we didn't go anywhere. Okay. Now I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, he goes, you know, uh, our, one of our good customers, City of Vaughan, uh, engine one, pumper one, because it's Ontario, pumper, not an engine. Oh, yeah. Pumper one was down. Uh, they needed a flux capacitor. We had a flux capacitor, but it was past our shipping deadline at the end of the day. So our parts team, we call them parts. We don't have a parts department anymore. We can talk more about that. But our parts, our parts salesperson called Uber, put the part on an Uber, and shipped it to the customer. No way. That's awesome. I said, that's friggin' awesome. I yeah, love that's that. awesome. I love that. So not only did it that, he's on the phone with the chief mechanic. He says, okay, your part's, your part's there. It's going to be there at this time. He says, I'm going to call you back when he's at the front gate because you might be closed. <laughs> you might be locked. He calls him back. He says, he's at your north door. Your part's at the north door. No way. And that's not anything that anybody would write in a business manual or your, your strategy, your plan to say, you know, we're going to use Uber to deliver trucks for fire for fire trucks. Yeah, but it's great problems. I'm like, hey, this truck's down, right? Like, you got to fix this thing. It's got to go back in service. So, and, and that gets back to we're professional problem solvers. He figured it out. That's I love awesome. that. I love that. <laughs> that was cool. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I'm almost drowning over here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Well, man, you know, I, I think there's so much, um, you know, when I hear your story, I, I hear so many ties between the fire service and, mm -hmm. you know, you quickly rose in executive leadership in the fire service. And I think that's an opportunity that some folks yearn for, but that some folks maybe will, won't never get to see. But it's like there, there's only so many yeah. chief officer positions or deputy chief officer positions in, in growing agencies. Yeah. But you've got a unique perspective that, you know, I think is cool to get to share with other firefighters. And I'm really interested in kind of like, you know, even what I really liked is that story of like in 2005, writing this plan for a business that you wanted to run and then have now yeah. kind of grown into that position of, of uh, having the opportunity to do so. And I'm curious, like, where does that go now? And if you had to write your five year, uh, or not your five year, but if you had to, if you're your 2005 self today, looking mm -hmm. forward, what are you writing down on that piece of paper and where are you going? Yeah. Um we're doubling down, you know. What's really interesting, Sam, is that vision that I had in 20, 2005 is as relevant or more relevant today. Um, and now we're just figuring out, um, we're trying new things and we're still, it's a never ending quest, right? We're on that never ending quest to be, you know, to, to, to make it easier for our customers to do business with us. Um, but it's, it's rooted in, you know, our mission is, is serving those that keep our community safe, right? That c continues to be our mission, and that'll never change. Yeah. Right? And it's externally focused. It's not internally focused. And I think that makes a big difference, you know? You know, we, we say a lot. It doesn't matter what we say. It only matters what they say. Are we doing a good yes. job or are we not doing a good it job? It really right? is a good point. It's like that's a great way to think about it. That it right? Ultimately, it's, it's not your, your call. It's your customers, so. It is, it is, right? They'll tell us whether we're doing it. You know, when they stop sending us money, we know we're doing a bad job, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I would say, and, and I'm, we're constantly just, re, re, 
I, I think we're building upon that still that vision that I had in 2005 about what our what what a company that I that I didn't even really have at the time <laughs> would yeah. be or would look like, and and this is the best part of my job. I have I have the best team in the league. You know, sometimes my competitors, you know, it, it, when we talk at trade shows and I say, you know, how are you guys doing it? And, and it's simple. I have the best team in the league. Mm. I have the most passionate, dedicated, knowledgeable, experienced team in the league who, and, and you can have all of those ingredients, but if they can't get behind what you're trying to do as a company, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So you take those ingredients and, 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 you put them in a in an organization, and they share that passion to serve, mm. and that's when the magic happens. How do you find that? That's team? when the magic. Like I feel like recruiting the, the best team in the league is not exactly, and uh, a, a read this book and do these things. Like, what do you do to find those people that are just such? A uh, yeah, uh, we have a pretty. It, it's crazy. Uh, we have a pretty extensive uh, uh, um, selection process. Mm. Um, are, uh, I like that word selection process. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you know, people talk a lot about fit. Uh, mm. You know, you want to have people that fit. So, you know, I don't know exactly what that means, but but here's what we look for: we look for people that can um, um, that share our passion to serve, mm. that can get behind our mission and support that, and figure out ways to get there. Uh, that are. Uh, in concert with and not in conflict with our values. So we talk mm -hmm. a lot about that. And we go through multiple rounds of interviews. And, and oftentimes, I don't sit in on any of those interviews. They're all team-based. Yeah. We put together our team and we and look for- And they bring you a recommendation and then as that kind absolutely. of- Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And they say, this is a person that, that we'd love to have on our team that we think is gonna help us build our team to help us to get there. And, you know, and we do look for, you know, we look for the technical, but we also look for that cultural fit. We talk a lot about, and we have a manual, I don't know how many questions are on it now, <laughs> that we yeah. give to our team, you know, and help them understand what it is that we're looking for. And we're always trying to evolve that and make it better. Um, but you know, you know, it's, it's hire slow, fire fast. And that mm -hmm. might sound crass, but you, you know, take your time and, and hire. don't be desperate. Mm. Don't be desperate, even though you need to build your team. And that gets back to that culture because once the team had, and it's the team that establishes the culture, it's not me, mm. right? I didn't establish the culture. I, you know, I set the vision where we're going and I didn't come up with Dilly Bar Day. The team came <laughs> up with Dilly Bar Day, right? Awesome. Which I happen to love, by the way. Yeah, it's good. awesome. Right. Maybe we're you know. <laughs> uh, uh, um, But then all of a sudden, it's the team that, that protects that culture. Yeah. And they're the ones, um, you, you know, and you got to be careful of that because um, um, you don't want it to become too, too insular either. Um, but what's really interesting over the past couple of years since we really started uh, um, paying more attention to this and having our team on the selection process, uh, and, and I'll say small d diversif diversification, our team is more diversified now than it ever has been hmm. um, in terms of backgrounds, in terms of experience. We don't necessarily just look for ex-firefighters. We do have ex-firefighters on our team who do a great job, uh, and we have people that as John Witt would say, didn't know the front from the back of a fire truck when they showed up here. <laughs> yeah. And yet they're our best part people now because they have, you know, one of our values is, is curiosity and wanting to learn, right? Yeah. Wanting to know, wanting to learn. Those are the people that are taking the external training program. So, so it's That's been cool. a really, it, it is really cool. It's something cool to watch. That's to watch great. it kind of uh, develop and evolve and, 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 uh, that's the best part of my job when when things like that happen. Well, I tell you, happening. this has been a really exciting story to hear, and it's always fun to you know get to be a part of that on the business side as well as kind of in just the storytelling side because I think half of uh, half of what makes the fire service unique is the storytelling that goes on in the stations. Yeah. And um, if folks want to learn more about you guys and your business, to follow you guys on socials or to catch you online, yeah. where would people go to find you or to follow what you guys are doing? It's in our name, our, our, you know, firetrucks.ca. Um, <laughs> One the, yep. website URL. Uh, <laughs> absolutely right. That's who we are. That's what we do. Um, uh, you know, our social media is Safe Tech Profile. You know, we're active on on, on uh, all the social media platforms. 
um, and our, our our team's doing a great job on 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 doing that stuff too and starting to share. So uh, that's how you can follow us. Well, that is fantastic. Please send your team our best regards and thanks for helping get this set up. I know there was a bit of technical, <laughs> yeah. funny business that went on getting it all going. Figured it out, yeah. But uh, it's really been a pleasure having you on the 2448. Thanks for being here. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for having me, Sam. Take yes, care. Yes, sir.